this is Dr. Borsier. There are times when we're first getting started writing where you wonder, what does it mean to write in academic, professional, generic, third person? What does that look like? And so I thought I would help you out to understand that concept as I walk through the beginning portion of a paper that I'm currently working on. I'm always writing something, and this is the, the current theme, if you will, of what I'm working on. So I will uh, make this available and you can review it and see my notes in the margins, but for now I'll go through it, the, the uh, abstract, the introduction, and the first paragraphs, and highlight some of the things to pay attention to that are directly parallel to the writing that you are working on as well as you become more professional, more academic, and use that third person generic which is required for the American uh, Psychiatric Association APA style guide. And so here we go. Uh, the topic is, or the uh, title is, Art as Spiritual Care from Trauma for Recovery. Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery, viewed through the hermeneutical lens of art therapy in contextual praxi, praxi with immigrants seeking asylum. That's a mouthful. As I read the abstract, I want you to pay attention to the fact that I never ever once say this paper or this writer. I write each statement as a fact. And these are facts that the person who then reads the paper later will expect to be documented or substantiated, if you will, through the sources that I use. So I will not need to say, this paper, this writer, I believe. It's each statement that says that for you, for the reader to get. So the abstract for this paper that I'm uh, currently working on. Art as Spiritual Care proposes a methodology which prioritizes Judith Herman's Trauma and Recovery 2015 in conversation with art therapy concepts and the theological construct of hope to generate a unique approach to art reflection as spiritual care for trauma victims. The mixed methods process is bilingual, cross-cultural, interreligious, and applicable for direct client, patient, and or parishioner care individually or in groups. The methodology evolved over a two-year period of facilitating an art ministry designed as spiritual care for women and children who had fled the extreme conditions of domestic violence, death threats, and political oppression, which precipitated their flight from trauma toward safe asylum in the U.S. Herman's theories also helped immigrant detainees to assimilate their stories for the daunting formal legal process required for their necessary asylum. The paper includes case studies and examples of the integrated art reflection process. That's the abstract. Again, so to point out that never once do I say my methodology or this paper or this writer. Each sentence goes together as a logical flow. I'm, I'm making a series of statements which I propose to be fact. And then now in the content of the paper, the reader will expect that to be documented and then explained further. And so the introduction material or the attention-grabbing material w will ultimately be the first paragraph in the paper that you write. So as you're wondering, oh, how do I get the attention? Well, what is interesting to you about it? What matters? What It would be looking at it as the so what. What is the big deal about this? And that's what you want to lead off with because people will read that first paragraph and make the decision whether or not it is interesting or not, whether the topic relates to what they want to research or read or learn more about, or if they're just like, no, this is so not it. And so you're kind of giving an overview of what they can expect in the subsequent paper or article that you write, and then the thesis statement, the exact thesis statement, is usually positioned as the final sentence in that opening paragraph. Now, um, generally, academic papers, uh, paragraphs range from four to eight sentences in that range. You'll vary the length of the par paragraph. Some will have mo uh, more sentences, some will have fewer. This first one uh, in my opening sentence or paragraph is fairly lengthy. It's a little bit longer than I normally do, but I am working to establish the context, which is so important to the argument for the paper, which of course would be the uh, refugee immigrant women and children seeking asylum in the United States. And so as we begin, notice some of the key details of how I introduce each um, source, that it's always in past tense, was, said, did, acted, or it's in present perfect, has been, has acted, has proposed, and never ever will you hear present tense. 
says, does, writes, proposes, because that is not acceptable APA um, format for the style of writing. And so listen to that. And then um, I also do include the page numbers and all that detail, which won't necessarily be helpful when I read it to you, but you can see the print version of it and that will uh, connect the dots and help you there. So to begin with that opening, attention-grabbing um, paragraph to help the reader get an understanding of what to expect from the paper. It is public information but not common knowledge that sever several thousand immigrant women and children are incarcerated in three for-profit family detention centers, two located near San Antonio and a third one near Philadelphia. Most of the women and children are victims of horrific violence fleeing from Central America's Northern Triangle of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. The women fled from misogynistic and patriarchal systems, which, as Dr. Herman, 2014, noted, is a whole system of coercive control that is ultimately maintained by force and terror, page 146. They left a system of dominance and subordination to make their case for asylum here amid the discombobulated and encumbered U.S. legal system where the families are at the mercy of the U.S. Border Patrol, Immigration Customs Enforcement, the for-profit prisons which incarcerate them, the daunting legalese, and the whims of a U.S. president. Muharista feminist Martel Otera, 2016, made the important point that Latinas, female uh, Hispanic women, are generally considered perennial outsiders, treated as nobodies within a racist, classist, and sexist structures that permeate the uh, United States society, page 2013. She described Latinas as, quote, the nobodies who are shooed away, dehumanized, stereotyped, and exploited and marginalized, page 235. Unfortunately, that low standing she has described is in addition to the asylum-seeking, incarcerated, so-called illegal alien labels. The refugee families have come seeking asylum in order to have life, for to remain in their own countries or to return could mean death. Morsier, 2017. The intimate and collective violence they suffered has done more than demolish their trust and self-respect, it is fair to say that their very lives have been destroyed. Anderson, 2016. Judith Herman, 2015, in recovery, Trauma and Recovery, provided the essential theory to integrate with a mixed methods art reflection process to help refugees seeking asylum to confront past atrocities, begin to create meaning in their present given the past injustices, in order to begin spiritual healing while simultaneously empowering these mothers to speak the unspeakable required to articulate their necessary case for asylum. Borsier, 2017. See also Shore, 2009. Now that is the opening. Um, get your attention, and hopefully it got some of your attention, and uh, that you would say, you know, I really want to learn more about this and read more about this and understand this context. And so the second paragraph becomes what is called the bridge or the transition. It's where you get a little bit more background information of what to expect as you continue on in the writing process. And so the second paragraph here, again, as the, the bridge to the meat or the heart and soul of the paper. While these women are vulnerable, it also is important to remember the courage, fortitude, and faith that made it possible for them to survive thus far. Their internal strength has been called poder desde, or power from within, Maher, 2008, page 273, as the mothers risked everything to save their children from exploitation, sexual violence, and death, while also escaping from the feminicide, which is indicative of their homelands, Benita Madrid, 2001. Naming their suffering as feminicide helps to make visible what otherwise might remain invisible and also focuses on what is behind their suffering and also our culpability. Schuschler Forenza, 1996, and Pinita Madrid, 2001. Their commitment to save their children resonates with what Gilligan, in 1982, demonstrated in that women not only define themselves in a context of human relationships, but also judge themselves in terms of their ability to care, page 17. 
for the refugee mothers, their, in, their sense of integrity clearly has been directly connected to the safety of their children. Sister Denise, a volunteer chaplain who assisted the last six months of the art ministry, aptly compared these mothers to being like a lioness protecting her cubs, Borsier 2017. And so now we've got the background, you're, you're getting more of a sense of what's to happen, and I'll do one more paragraph here, which now launches into the specifics about my part in it. Because it is my original research and my original art therapy reflection process that I am describing, I need to say I. I need to say my. You would never do that unless it was your original work. And reading other people's stuff is not considered original work. So it's only when you get in the field and you're doing the down and dirty research through qualitative or quantitative research that you then become the authority in that area because you are documenting it with that actual research that you have done. Otherwise, you will continue to write in that generic third person and document it with the sources of the people who did that field research. Um, but in my case, I need to say my because it is, in fact, my research and that is what they are interested in hearing about when I present this paper. And so you also want to lead in with some subheads to guide the reader with what's happening now. And so I have a bold type subhead here, Art as Spiritual Care, as I move to this third paragraph and the final one that I'll read for you in this session. My methodology has embedded Dr. Herman's trauma theory with art therapy concepts as adapted to a pastoral care model of hope set against the framework of feminist theory and a theology of social justice. See Herman, 2015, Allen, 20, 2005, Kaplan, 2009, Rappaport, 2009. My tight focus here highlights her first principle of recovery, empowerment of trauma survivors as the backdrop for my guided art reflection process. The metaphor, quote, art as a safe container, end quote, has been a common phrase in art therapy, complementing Dr. Herman's emphasis on the necessity to establish safety before trauma recovery could or should begin. See Rappaport 2009, McNiff 2015, the, to borrow the phrase used by Arnheim 2006, for the mothers I worked with, art served as a helper in their time of trouble, page 133. For as Cassu and Cubley, uh, 1995, aptly noted, art served as their healing balm for, quote, to create is to work at the level of the soul, end quote, page 128 which, when fully understood, might be why Leo Tolstoy, 1995, once proposed that art is, quote, one of the most necessary means of communication without which humanity cannot live, end quote, page 41. The activity room at the detention center was transformed into holy ground as the art sessions became sacred space for the mothers to express and to contain their traumas. See Allen, 2005, Cassu and Cubley, 1995, Farrelly, Hansen, 2001, Merrick, 2001, Jackman, 2004, and Stone, 2003. My art reflection process facilitated healing by helping the participants to accept the pain of their past, name their fears in the present, and confront the uncertainty of their future. See also McNiff, 2001. And so here's the introductory part. I want to um, bring out some notes. I have put notes in the margins when you look at the uh, printed version on, to pay attention to how I introduce each of the authors. It's always in past tense, simple past, or present perfect. Note the difference between those two, simple past, uh, argued. Would say that's something that happened in the past. Uh, Borsier argued art therapy practices are relevant for pastoral care. So argued past tense. Now, if that argument is going on into the future, then you would choose the present perfect tense. So, Borsier has argued that art therapy practices are applicable to pastoral care. So, argued, it happened in the past, it stayed in the past. Has argued, it started in the past, but it continues on and is relevant into the, in the present and into the future. You'll, I'd like you to notice when you look at this, the print example how I format each one of the pa uh, parenthetic references. And also note that the words I use to introduce the authors, they vary. I don't use the same one all the time. Noted, said, proposed, argued. Um, they vary. And it helps to break it up and make it more interesting for the reader. 
Also, there are words in there that help to describe whether I agree or disagree when I introduce the text. And so I have um, underlined some as you go through, and you'll see some of the examples to say that uh, Dr. Herman noted that's a simple past tense with no elaboration there, but later on when the uh, feminist, muhuristic feminist Martel Otera, I said that made the important point. That's saying, I agree. I agree with what she said, made the important point. Uh, another example would be when uh, you could say, so-and-so aptly stated. Well, aptly, again, says that you're standing alongside them. You don't have to say, I agree with that person. You do it by the word you use to describe or to summarize after. And another point to notice as you're reading this and seeing it in print, it's easier than hearing it. Notice that I don't string one quote after another after another. They're always introduced. There's always something of my own in between. And then I would introduce the next direct quote as well. So you never do a drive-by, drop a quote, and off you go. You always introduce it, and you always follow up with something of your own. It's quite simply, it is the they said, I say. Only you're not putting I say in there. You're just making a statement and saying it as fact, and maybe then adding another reference. And finally, I'd like you to notice that in the social sciences, I'm a theologian, and this social science is not the normal way that I reference and footnote because when I, when I write for other theologians, they use a completely different style guide. They use Cape Turabian or sometimes MLA. But in social sciences, you have to play by the rules on how the social scientists like to do their writing, which is lots and lots of references. If one person said something, great. But if five people said it, and all five of them are very important, then you include all five of them because it shows the reader, wow, that, that writer, that done their homework, that's, that's perfect. So not just one source, that's all you have, that's fine. But if you have a second one and you know that that second one said something similar, that tells the reader, hey, They've done their homework. There's another source that I can go and look to. Now, I did not in my um, the print version, you will not see my fully uh, formatted references, but of course you will need to fully format yours using APA style. I did give a highlight for you that you can do them either evenly double-spaced in hanging text, or you can make each individual reference in single-spaced and leave one space and then do the next reference. And then they need to be listed in alphabetical order, starting at the top with A, and going down to the bottom with Z. So I hope this has been helpful to you to look at what it means to write in academic, generic, professional, third person where you are making declarative statements and documenting them with your sources. Thank you.